Yeah. Okay, good morning again. Today is the December the 5th, 2021. This is 1st Thessalonians lesson number 107, 107. There are two families out with COVID um, and other related issues. The Van Vorsts, that's Tamara, Aaron, and Alex. And then um, the Andersons, Andy has it and uh, Andy Sr. Uh, Trish has it and their daughter Melinda came here to help her father and she might get it if she didn't have it. I'm not sure if she got the shots or not. So um, since she lives in Canada, once she is found to be positive, I think she has to wait two weeks or something like that, you know. So it's, it's, it's crazy, just, you know. And um, that's what's going on. Um, what else? First Thessalonians chapter four, let me read verses one and two. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to work and to please God, so ye would abound, so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time in your word. I thank you for what your son did on the cross. I thank you for the continuing grace. I thank you for the, the free gift of the grace of God that we, uh, we can know that we're saved and we can't lose it. And again, I thank you for this assembly. Amen. Now, Scripture shows us how God has changed the rules for obedience throughout history. This is the bitter review. And we talked of moral laws and symbolic slash ceremonial laws. Symbolic ceremonial laws were mainly used to separate Israel from the nations. They dressed different, they ate different, they worshiped different. Um, uh, moral laws do not conflict with each other, but ceremonial laws often do. Remember, a moral law prohibits behavior that leads to harm. Thou shalt not kill. That's a moral law. Matthew 12, 1 and 2. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath. So they were pointing the finger, look it, they're plucking the corn, they shouldn't be doing that. They were hungry. This, this is what David did. Um, the Pharisees say it is not lawful to work on the Sabbath, but the priests work in the temple on the Sabbath. So they violate a commandment, but they're not a accountable for it. If, you're, if you know what I'm, understand what I'm saying here. Paul repeats nine of the ten commandments for us in his epistles. Nine of them. But the Sabbath is a ceremonial law and came in before Moses. David and his men also ate the showbread to keep from starving. Once again, all those ceremonial laws were given to demonstrate the distinctiveness God gave to separate the nation of Israel. Understanding God's purpose with Israel is key. Now, there's a big part of this message where I'm going to go back in the Old Testament. I'm tired of hearing people say that we don't study the Old Testament. Then we only study Paul. Then we never study the Gospels or Hebrews. It gets me up to about here. You know, I'm just irritated. It's just, it's not, it's not right. They get something in their mind and they won't believe it even when you tell them something different. That you, yeah, we do study these things. Now in Thessalonians and Colossians 2, we don't have any more, any ceremonies and symbolical, rit, symbolical rit, rituals to obey. We have just the reality of the life of Christ and his grace to us. We're not, Paul does not give us a bunch of do's and don'ts like Sam was talking about, the, the, the works of the law. We have God's grace. You think of grace, and we're, here, here it is. It's right here. What do I do to get it? You grab it. You believe it. You're in dwell. Can you lose it? No, because God sealed it. No matter what anybody else says, believe the verses. Don't believe me. Don't believe people that say you can lose it. They're trying to control you. And that's the last thing you want to do of, under grace. Colossians 2, 14 to 17, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Question. Is this a change from the previous to Paul? Where does Moses say anything about this? Moses supported the rules and regulations, didn't he? The 613 commandments. Is this a change? Most definitely. But we are, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. We are not in the shadow program. Now what I'm going to do, I'm gonna go, if you go back to uh, Joshua. Joshua, good, good. Go to Joshua chapter 9. Now, if you remember what I handed out last week about the books of the Bible, and this would fit in the pre-exile books before Israel was exiled. There's nine pre-exile books and nine post-exile books. Okay, it balances on either side. So this is when they came into the land and started messing up. Which, which ended up in their deportation, you know, the takeover of Israel and the southern two tribes in, in the times of the Gentiles beginning, beginning. Now, I'm doing this for a specific reason. To show the importance of studying the entire Bible. The more you understand Israel's history, and you've heard me say this before, the better ambassador you will make. And if you believe what's written... Then you go to the Gospels and study that, the earthly ministry of Christ, therefore Israel still under the law, right? Then you go to the book of Acts and see not the physical fall of Israel, which happened in the Old Testament, but the spiritual fall of Israel in Acts chapter 7. You would become, and then Paul's epistle, you would become a dispensationalist. Politically correct. I guarantee that. If you read the Old Testament Gospel, you would, and you believed it, you, there would be no other choice for you to make. I understand Paul and his message. I understand that he was the last one that God gave him information to to write down. The other apostles believed that, and you can see that in Scripture. We're not under the law. Salvation is a free gift. You know, that was going on Second 2 Timothy 2.12. You know, we, if we suffer a loss, we're going to reign with him. If we don't, we're not going to reign with him. We're still going to be in heaven. There's gold, silver, precious stones, wooden hand, stubble. If all your works are burned off, you still get heaven. Period. End of story. Just believe the verses. 1 Corinthians 3.15. So, what I'm trying to say is, every Christian, and I'll say it right to the camera, should be dispensational. Now, I know they might not like hearing that. And I know they don't. I'm not trying to be argumentative. Well, maybe I am a little bit. I want to get your, your ire up a little bit. I want to get you angry with me. I want you to get, be real mad at me and go and study these issues. Study them yourself. Understand, you see the transition from Israel. When did Israel, when did they fall physically? In the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian. When did they fall spiritually? Acts chapter 7. Now, that should put something in your head. Then in Acts 8, 1, you see Saul, who was also Paul, he was consenting unto the death of Stephen. But then in Acts chapter 9, now he was a Pharisee. He gets saved on the road to Damascus. God says he had cho he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. In other words, for the whole world, not just Israel, because we're all guilty. There's no other way to understand the Bible other than dispensationally. Remember, Politically correct. Now that music thing I did, um, that's what it's entitled, politically correct. Debbie came up with that title. Okay, so there were, let me give you an example of shadow program. Um, Abimelech, now remember, Joshua through, through Second Chronicles are nine pre-exile books before they, they're taken in captive. There are five Abimelechs in scripture. This one, in Judges, Joshua chapter 9, 
was the ruler of Shechem during the period of the judges. He was a son of Gideon by a concubine from Shechem. Abimelech tried to become kin, king, and he did reign over Israel for three years, Judges 9.22. I'm not going to go to these verses for time's sake. In order to eliminate all those who might challenge his authority, he killed the, all the other sons of Gideon, his brothers and half-brothers, who were potential successors to, of his father. You see that in Judges 9 and 2 Samuel 11.21. Jotham, and I looked up the word, how to pronounce Jotham, the youngest of son of Gideon escaped death at the hands of Abimelech. Abimelech was killed in a battle at Thebes, a city northeast of Shechem, which he surrounded with his army. When Abimelech ventured too close on the city's walls, a woman dropped a millstone on his head, crushing his skull. When Abimelech ventured, I'm sorry, Abimelech commanded his armor bearer to kill him, so it could not be said that he died at the hands of a woman. Can women kill? Do women feel like killing at times? Don't, ladies, you don't have to answer. I know, I know the answer to that. I'm waiting for that baby to come. Boy, you know, um, boy, I, I, was, I was hoping it was going to be here. I can't wait to smell that baby. It's just, anyway. Yeah, women can kill people. They can get angry enough. What about the one who nailed, put a nail on the guy's head when he went to sleep? She lured him in, coke, you know, he drank some warm milk and goes to sleep, bang, right through the temple, he's nailed to the ground. You, you, you nailed it. You see some of those programs about the women in, on, on uh, Skid Row, not, they're in their murder's row, they're going to be, you know, killed by, by uh, well, there, there's, there's a lot of women that have killed a lot of men for a lot of reasons. And there were serial women killers, too. One time, uh, I know i got to get off it, but one time, when, quite a few number of years ago, I think I've told the story, but there was a fellow that was going to go to a Bible study, and he heard that a woman was going to be teaching it. Well, what should I do? Women aren't supposed to teach me. What should I do? I says, does she know more than you? He goes, yeah. Is she calling herself a pastor? He goes, no. I said, sit back and enjoy it. Don't get all, don't you get your knickers in a twist. So, now this wish did not come true. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that a woman killed me, because it was recorded in 1206 B.C. Everybody's known about this for a long time. Okay. In Judges 9, there are four trees that depict the nation of Israel. Judges 9, 7 through 9. And when they told it to Jotham, he went out and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hear May I hearken unto you. The trees went forth. Now there's four trees here depicting Israel in a certain way. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? Now, See that, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God might hear unto you. May I hearken unto you? A lot of Christians pray this way. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be saying prayers, and I want you to join me in prayer, so maybe God will hearken unto you. What do you mean, hearken? Maybe he'll do something for you in your life. Everything that man needs, he's already done. He died on the cross for our sins. Period. Nothing more, nothing less than that. It's a done deal. And that's why we, we can be happy. So, if you go to First, Second Corinthians chapter four, keep your keep your hand open to Joshua there, Joshua nine, Judges. I wasn't even in the right book. I was just reading off my notes. I told you to go to First, Second Corinthians four. Yeah, in Second Corinthians chapter four. Let me start at verse um, 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus 
and shall present us with you. Remember that presentation ceremony? You got the day of redemption, the judgment seat, and the presentation ceremony. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. He gets the glory all the time. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perisheth, yet, our in, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. This is said all the time through Paul's epistles. It's an inner man message. For our light affliction, we have a woman over there that's a few days overdue. Is it a light affliction? Us guys don't know anything about that. The only time I couldn't turn over in my, in my bed if a world rolled to one side is when my wife made meatloaf. And it was like a rock and I couldn't even turn over in bed because it was so heavy. But I still love it. All right. I didn't mean to start an argument here. People, get, put your hands down. <laughs> For which cause we faint not, but though our outward men perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Where we look not at the things which are seen, that's the problem right there in Christianity. But at the things which are not seen, for the things that which are seen are temporal. They're temporary. They're fleeting. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, do you have any trouble understanding that verse? If you eat one of those cupcakes, you might. The ones we bought. A lot of sin in there. The olive tree represents Israel's spiritual life, the special separated status and access of covenant blessing. It's as though the Gentiles come to Israel and say, come reign over us like God created you to do. Olive oil is a type of the Holy Spirit, entrance, spiritual access. The door of the temple was made by, of olive wood. In, first, in Jeremiah 11, verses 16 to 17, it says, The Lord called thy name a green olive, fair and goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Now, this represents spiritual, spiritual Israel. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee. Here's what we find out when we go back to the Old Testament and read about, about Israel. They were evil a lot of times, just like us. They weren't any better than us, except they had, a better, they had the true God. But they couldn't make it because of their nature, the sin nature. For the Lord of souls that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, that's north and south, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Now, does this bring forth anything? Is Paul saying, you're not going to see something, you can understand something. I'm going to give you these words, you sit down, you read them, and you believe them. Before, I want you to go to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, and let me read you a couple of verses with regard to what we're supposed to be doing. We know that 2 Corinthians 4 is a presentation ceremony, just like 2 Corinthians 11. Paul, all the time, is telling us God works in the inner man. In other words, we don't have to look around to see if uh, God loves us anyway. We don't have to look that we can know that. Proverbs 1, 16, verse 10. I believe, therefore, ha I, I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. When you believe the gospel of the grace of God, what does God tell us to do when you get saved? Speak. Not stand up there and make like you're some kind of super-duper guy. God's answering all your, you know, giving you everything you want. Proverbs 21, 28. A false witness shall perish. A false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. The gospel of grace fits this. 
and for folks that don't rightly divide, the gospel of the kingdom is not for us today. That was a previous message, going to be a future message. It's the gospel of grace that saves today for almost 2,000 years. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I'm thinking, how many times do you have to hear this before you, you know, there's no physical intervention after the book of Acts. None. Why? Because Paul completed God's revelation to man. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Excuse my voice. That came from eating the meatloaf. Okay. Now I ask you to go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Turn over from verse 17. Now again, you read before in, in Judges 9, he, the Israel's burning. The, the north, the, they, they were... They weren't, weren't any good. God burned them. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. The root, by the way, is Abraham, the, the promise of eternal life. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. What do you think we're talking about in Judges? Nine. The four trees, they failed. And thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. In other words, the dispensation of grace is not going to be here forever. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. This is not a verse that says you can lose your salvation. So I'm talking about the reconciliation of the world, verse 15. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. What are you talking about? Fall on Israel. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature back in, into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? In other words, God's not finished with the nation of Israel. Let me read you three more verses. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. We go to Luke 16, he talks about the times of the Gentiles. When did the times of the Gentiles begin? In what part of the Old Testament? First Kings 12, right? You got Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and Jeroboam, the concubine, kid of a concubine. The ten tribes were overtaken by the uh, Assyrians. Then Judah and Benjamin were overtaken by Babylon. That started the time of the Gentiles. Israel's not ruling anymore. Gentiles have been ruling since that time. That's their physical fall. For I would not prove that she should be wise, ignorant of this mystery, lest she should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. Blindness in part. What does he say in part? Because a Jew gets saved the same way a Gentile is today. They go to the cross. They go to Paul's epistles. They understand the gospel of grace. And so all of Israel shall be saved as it is written. God's still got something to do with the nation of Israel. You read about that in the last nine books in your Bible. He was for revelation. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. We're not under any covenant, folks. We're under grace. Now, Judges 9, verses 10 and 11. And the tree said to the fig tree, Come now and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? The fig tree is a type of Israel's religious life, her self-righteousness. When you're under the law, you become self-righteous. Look what I've done. I prayed for four hours. I ate this. I didn't eat that. 
that makes you think that somehow you're helping God. What about, you? remember in the, in the Catholic Church, they talk about a novena. People pray down here, the people in purgatory will pray even more and get you out of purgatory so you can go to be with God. In other words, Christ did not do everything. He did not die for the sins of all the world and future generations. You still have to do something. You've got to be in this church. You've got to understand what a novena is. People interceding and praying to God. Let them out of purgatory. Let them in hell. I mean, in heaven. Let them go to heaven. That's childish thinking. Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They tried to cover their sin with the work of their own hands. That's the definition of religion. Man, look at Matthew 21, 18 to 20. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereupon, thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus Christ wants to replace their religious life with spiritual life. Adam and Cain also did this. What did Adam do? They fell in the garden. They went and got some fig leaves, made clothes. All right? Birch's Bible. What about Cain? He took his cursed body, plowed the cursed earth, and offered the Lord a cursed sacrifice. The Lord didn't have respect for Cain. That sacrifice. Now, this helps explain the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. Matthew is the type of the book that shows Jesus Christ as the king. So the genealogy of Matthew starts from Abraham. But when you come to Luke, it's about the son of man. He goes all the way back to Adam. So you got Matthew the king, Mark the servant, there's no genealogy. Then you have Luke, the son of man. Then you have John, God. He doesn't have a genealogy. He's the one that began it all. Now in Luke 13, 7 and 9 on your paper, he gave Israel another year. They said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this, this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Now, Acts, first seven chapters of Acts, is this one-year time period. He gave Israel a chance. He took the charge of murder on the cross and lowered it down to manslaughter, as it were. Another chance to understand that Jesus Christ, who they had just killed, was the Messiah. What happens? What happens in that time? You know what, really, how can I say this? Um, there's many histories of Israel in the Old Testament. And when you get to Acts, Acts 7 is the history of Israel. Part of Acts 13 is the history of Israel. And I, go, I ask that you go, go there and, and read them. He, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, it's the national section of the book of Romans. Romans 9 is Israel time past, 10 is now, and 11 is ages to come. Just what we've been talking about. With all this history about the New Testament, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. With all this history about the nation of Israel, Why would God show a condensed, very condensed history of Israel in 1 Corinthians 10? Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant of, of how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now this is Paul speaking to the Jews in the book of Acts time period. And we're all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea dry baptism, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, 
and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, that's capital R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Concupiscence, Sam. That's the red. That's how you pronounce it. Concupiscence. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. That's the book of Numbers. Old Testament. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed in, of the destroyer. This is all in, in the Old Testament. Okay? Now all these things happened unto them for examples and samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You know what an admonition is? It's a mild rebuke or a warning. Look at the next verse. Wherefore let him thinketh, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If you don't understand Pauline truth, you know, I'm a broken record. If you're not dispensational in your study of the Bible, what does this verse tell you? I can tell you what it tells me. Study Paul's epistles. Study the whole Bible. Because the whole Bible, before Paul will back up, the, the only thing that, that God gave to mankind, because we can't save ourselves, is when he started the dispensation of the grace of God, he offered salvation as a free, lift, free gift, and you can't lose it. Was that ever made back here? No. A whole new different dispensation that's been ongoing for almost 2,000 years. Genesis 1 through 11 is about 2,000 years. Genesis 12 through 50 is about another 2,000 years, right? And for 2,000 years, he's offering salvation that comes through the gospel of grace and the dispensation of grace. We're, we're a bunch of we're fellow soldiers in, in a ship. The word admonish is used three times, and only by Paul. Now, where is that here? So Acts 1 to 7, was, Israel was given that year given by God for, for Israel to repent, to acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Let me read verses 11 to 13. For the bodies of those priests whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Not in the camp, without it. Whereby Jesus also, <clears throat> that he may, might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, out of the camp. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Now, I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus 4. In Leviticus 4,
try. Thanks. All right. Good. Sorry for the interruption. So we're in Leviticus 4. We're talking about sacrifices. Verse 8. And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys that shall be taken, you take it away. Now the next three verses. As it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of the burnt offering, in the skin of the bullock and all his flesh, with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung, that also be burned in the fire, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt. The way Israel thought of Jesus, he was nothing better than an animal sacrifice. He suffered the fire of hell in, 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 his, in his soul on the cross outside the camp. Because what's going on in the camp? Well, doesn't Satan, if somebody gets killed and somebody revives, for the second half of Revelation, right, the tribulation, he says we have to do these sacrifices. They start the sacrificial stuff again in the, in the, in the ages to come here, when, when this, this is going to happen. And we've been, God has held back 2,000 years from that time period starting, because he wants all men to get saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, <clears throat> the fig tree was only one religion, there was only one religion given by God and given to Israel through the hands of Moses, the law. It brought a curse upon mankind. Galatians 3.10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 613 commandments, people. You've got to do everyone perfect. Otherwise, you, you fail. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Second Peter describes what they will need. They need the knowledge of Jesus Christ to endure without the camp. Now, in Judges 9, 12 to 13, Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and men, and men, and go to be promoted over the trees? I remember Rick preaching when he worked at the Mobile Rescue Center. He said, every drunk knew this verse, right? Wine's, God drinks wine. He's supposed to drink it, you know, make it cheerful. The vine tree represents the national life of Israel. Psalm 80, verse 8. Thou hast brought, thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Psalm 80, 15 to 16. And the vineyard which they, thy right hand planted, hath planted, and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself, it is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Something's going wrong with the nation of Israel. They're messing things up. Isaiah 5, verse 4 and 5. What could have been done more to my vineyard that have not done, done in it. Wherefore, when I looked at it, it should bring forth great grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now it says this two times in this passage, in verse 2. Remember what wild grapes means? It's called stink berries, a foul smell, all right, a stench. So now Judges 9, 14 to 15. So we got the, the olive tree, the fig tree, we have the vine tree. Now, Judges 9, 14 to 15. Then said all the trees under the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. A bramble was a tough, tangled, prickly, woody shrub. It's in the tree family. 
The bramble tree represents apostate Israel, a type of the Antichrist. Isaiah 34, verse 13. And thorns shall come up in her, pla in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortress thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. What happened in Genesis 3 when they fell, when talking about how do you make a living? How do you support yourself? You're going to sweat? You got all the brambles, the, the stickers and the weeds and the you know, thorns and all that? You know, sweat. You're gonna, it's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have pain in childbirth, too. Luke 6, 44. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. So, an olive tree has a substance. It's olive oil. A fig tree has a substance. Figs. A vine tree has a substance, grapes. But all the bramble can offer is a shadow. It's a counterfeit. There is no substance in a shadow. Now, I want you to think of 1 Corinthians 14. Let me read it to you. What does Paul say about his ministry? 1 Corinthians 14, 37 and 38. He, they're, they're, they're questioning Paul. They don't... This is 1 Corinthians. It was written in the Acts 19 time period. Um, he would have been talking to a lot of Jews trying to convince them. And he says in verse 36, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Now we all know about people that say God talks to them. Told them things to do. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Did you ever say that to somebody that told you God spoke to them? Do you believe Paul? No. He can't believe Paul. He's going back in the Gospels or in the early Acts when they had the signs. Well, this right here says you have to believe that Paul was given the word of God. And you're not believing that. Because all those things, they were temporary during that time period. But after the book of Acts, there's no more miracles, signs, and wonders other than the word of God being completed through Paul. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Don't even argue with those people. Just give them what they want. If they want to be ignorant, you know, you can try it, but you don't, don't argue. That's, that's the way they want to be. They don't want to change their mind. Now think about that passage. Let me read the passage again in 1 Corinthians 10. Just for effect. Um, just for effect. Here's a condensed little history, 11 verses. Now, you've got a lot more verses in Acts 7 and Acts 13. And, and, and Psalms, they got histories of Israel and all that. Let me read this again. It's, a, it's talking about Israel in the, in the wilderness, a warning example. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant of this. Uh, ignorant how that all our fathers were, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Why? To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to drink and rose up to play, eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ. Prove to me your God. Make my car payment. 
Put a big bundle in the bank for me. As some of them were also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Our learning, our, 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 for our benefit. Now, all those shadows and types and ceremonies were a picture of what God is doing, is going to do in his kingdom, the earthly kingdom. We'll be in the heavenly one. In the ages to come. So you got time passed. This is, anyway, we can get this thing higher, like maybe up here, because I don't think, time passed. But now, dispensation, ages to come. Hebrews to Revelation. But that isn't us, is it? He's not talking about us. He had a particular little outpost of a divine nation with a particularly designed culture, habits, and diet to be different from everybody else. Mankind doesn't need any more rules and regulations they can't keep. And grace teaches us that. Mankind does not any, need any more rules or regulations that they can't keep. Paul comes along and says, that's all out the window. Here. The man who believes, if you believe it, that you're a sinner and Christ died for your sins, you're sealed, you're indwelt and sealed until, until the day of redemption. Man needs the life of grace of the grace of God, the acceptance of God, and the love of God. That's what grace gives us. Let me read that again. Mankind, men and women, need the life of the grace of God, the acceptance of God, and the love of God. This is what you find when you come to Paul. We are an outpost to dem demonstrate that, this little assembly. Not to say sin doesn't count, but to say God has, su has successfully put it away We are an outpost to demonstrate that. Put it away though the cross, through the crosswork of Christ. God has successfully put it away through the crosswork of Christ. The Lord paid for everything that is wrong with us and given his life in, in place of that. That's grace. This is grace. So when Paul writes of the commandments he has given us, as seen in the following. Titus 1, verses 2 and 3. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. You want a commandment? Here's a commandment for you. In this dispensation, do you know what the commandments of God are? They are the preaching committed to us through the Apostle Paul. This is why Paul write, writes 1 Corinthians 14, 37 and 38 again. If any man think himself to be a partaker, a, a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I'm doing a couple things two different times because I want, you know, these are God's instructions to us today in the dispensation of grace. They are the truth of who we are in Christ. The body is of Christ. It is Christ living his life out through me because of a thinking process he has instilled in me through his word. That's what Brother Sam was preaching. He puts in us not rules and regulations, but wisdom to live life to reflect the divine viewpoint acquired through the renewing of our minds. It is living like an adult, a grown-up son, so that we know how to possess our body, our vessel. Do you know how to possess your body? Guess what would happen if I asked that to most Christians? God gave them the spirit of tongues or whatever, you know. It has nothing to do with that. Do you know how to possess your body? First Thessalonians chapter th 4, verses 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, 
that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. It's not just don't do this or don't do that. It's the knowing how to be in possession, control of my person in such a way that I reflect what God thinks. How God guides and leads us today is not through physical intervention. Rather, it's the path of wisdom. This is why Paul starts the books, the book in Thessalonians, making sure that the Thessalonians know some things that, which will affect their walk. He gives them words. He gives them wisdom. He says, study. He says, how to study? How do you God's, get God's approval? 2 Timothy 2.15, you study. Now there's a, an author out there by the name of Ayn Rand. I don't read her books, but I, I saw this quote, and I thought it, was, it, would, it fits, because we preach reality, do we not, in real life? She said, you can avoid a reality, but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. If you think that God gave you some kind of power that you can spiritually cleanse bodies and people, prove it. It's all in your mind. So let's keep that in mind. It's the wisdom, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that God's word in you, it gets in you, that works its way out of you, reflecting what, the way God thinks, and the way he wants us to be. That's how you possess your vessel. Dear Lord, again, thank you for, for this time in your word. And anybody that's listening in another place, I just think that if you're not saved, make the choice now. It's a logical choice, not an emotional choice. Understand that you're a sinner. Christ died for your sins. You're buried Rose the third day. Okay, he died for your sins. The moment you believe that, you're in 12, you're sealed by God, the Holy Spirit, and you can't lose it. Amen. Thank you.